All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are. We on We TV. Special guest today, DJ Bam, Mr. Dwayne State. How you doing today, Mr. Bam? Yeah, man, and it's all good. We. It's all good, man. <laughs> yeah. We gonna get the people what they want, man. We gonna give them some raw, uncut today, right? You know what I'm saying? We gonna um, we gonna get the people the story, cause a lot of people may know your name, but they know bam and uh we're gonna jump right into it you know we're gonna jump right into it so so you had a good day today bam man it was all good every day is a good day every day is a, a, a good day but yeah i had a good day today okay. how about you bro i'm doing all right man i can't complain man can't complain you know so all the wt v listeners out there uh please uh go and subscribe and press like uh, if you're watching this by YouTube, please subscribe. It's very important uh, that we keep this platform going so we can get uh, much content out to the viewers uh, and make this thing pop, right? So, moving right along, um, we got a nice gentleman right here. And when I say DJ Bam, when I first met this guy, we had a nice vibe off the break. And come to find out, we both is the same Zodiac sign. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool, man. That's that's, that's cool. That, that means you cool, man. You cool, man. Appreciate it. Man. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Give me, as, as a young man growing up, you know, give me, uh, take me back to, you know, a little bit of your youth, you know. Um, born in uh, D.C., lived in the Southeast probably for, probably to the mid seven. I think around third, fourth grade, we moved out to Forsville, out near Forsville Skate Ring. And uh, I grew up there until I moved on, uh, Everything was cool. I'm an only child. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm your typical latchkey kid type of kid. Okay. Growing up, you know, I didn't really want for a whole lot. You know, parents, right. stable household, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of love in the house, you know what I'm saying? And Whoa. always had, you know, the support for whatever my crazy mind wanted to do. My, mm -hmm. my parents was always like 100, go for it. Both parents in the house? Yeah, both, both parents, parents in the house. house. And uh, 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 my mom was a, a dental assistant. Mm -hmm. And my dad drove for Metro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah, That's yeah, good. yeah. He drove for Metro, actually, DC Transit when he started. And I was a kid riding riding a bus, like, as a young kid. All through the city. Yeah. In the summertime, yeah. I, he'd be like, come on. I go get on the bus up Mount Pleasant, Columbia. That was his run up there, up, north, up 16th Street. I think they call it the H8 or something like that. I don't remember the number, but uh, you know, up back there. in the day though, that I used to, you know, as a kid, you look forward to that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, but yeah, I had a happy, happy, good yeah. childhood. Yeah. How um, high school you went to? I went to Largo. Largo high school. High school. Yeah, they bust us from Forsville all the way over to Largo. <laughs> what year was that? Tell me how they do that. They said they bust. They bust us because I live out by district. I should have went to like Suitland most likely. Okay. But the year I went to high school, I went to Spalding Junior High School, mm -hmm. which was like right at like maybe less than a mile from Forsville Skating Ring. And the year I came out of junior high school, they were changing Spalding Junior High School into Forsville High School. Mm -hmm. So they rearranged the boundaries. And the boundaries that I was in, my side got bust all the way out to Largo High School. And the people across the street from me went to Sutton. So, uh, you know, um, great time there though, but that's why I went to high school at Largo, out in, out in uh, Upper Marlboro. Upper Marlboro, yeah. okay. Uh, so, uh, you a musician? Oh yeah. So when did you get your start in music? My first official journey into music was the third grade. Uh, I took band playing the saxophone. Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, and I did that, you know, in band, and you just 
start playing uh, introductory and all that. My father played the saxophone, so oh, okay. when I expressed the interest in music, until I really found out that was the first instrument they, you know, they 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 kind of led me towards. Right. So you know, I played and I was serious about my craft, but probably around the fifth grade is when my true passion kicked in, which was the drums. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, five piece, you had five piece drum set? I had set. a little five piece J.C. Penny drum set. Okay. My parents got me. All right. <laughs> I didn't take it in school or nothing, but yeah. they got it. And you know, I just had a little five piece J.C. Penny drum set. You get out the catalog, that shows my age. Right. And uh, <laughs> Right, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> Like anything, you know, I would take the, the, the school band, the saxophone during the day, but I couldn't wait to get home play them drums. to play them drums. Yeah. Put the, look, go downstairs, grab my father's eight track, yeah. pop in the eight track, put the headphones on, I'm playing with the with the music. Wow. And, you know, and that's where it started for me. That was, that was where my love of music really started mm -hmm. in elementary school. So take me, uh, take me back to, uh, High school. So what, what what was DJ Bam, Mr. Dwayne like in high school? I was a I wasn't a popular kid in school, for sure. Okay. I, not at all. Um I was the you know, I was cool. I had a lot of friends, you know, I hung around with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um but I was that. It was about me. It was as far as I can remember. My life was always about music. There you go. You know what I'm saying? It was always about music. Even in, by the time I got to high school, I was in the marching band. I was. I played the drums in the concert band. Mm -hmm. I played. Uh, uh, I had like three periods of a band when I was in high school. Seriously, <laughs> real talk. I had like three <laughs> periods of band, different types of. Yeah, you I were would, determined. You were determined. I played the drums for like the 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 the, 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 the choral sing, you know, the choir that go sing. Yeah. And they have a band that back them up. Of course. I played the drums, and I had a period for that. Okay. I had a period for. Uh, here's the interesting part. When I first went to high school, my very first year, I was advanced in saxophone. Okay. So my very first year of high school, I was in the in the, the, the like the concert band, the advanced band, mm -hmm. and I played the saxophone. But I also had an introductory class of playing the drums right. because I played them at home, but I didn't really know how to read music and stuff like that. That was gonna be my next question. Did, yeah. Did you learn or did you? I did. So you did learn how to read music. That's yeah. that's hard too. Yeah. And so that that actually started my last year of, of junior high school. I took introductory band and drums because I wanted to learn how to read the music. Okay. So by the time I got to high school, I was doing both. I would have one advanced class for the saxophone and then I had like an intermediate class for the drums because I'm trying because I wanted to transition completely to the drums. Okay. I ain't want to play saxophone no more. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Especially because when I went to high school, it was 82. It was my first year in high school. Okay. I need to jump back Two years before that, 1980 is when it really, really changed for me. Because right. 77, 78, when I'm in, you know, I'm playing, I said I would come home playing my JCPenney drum set. Right. When I went to junior high school, first year, 1979, 1980, mm -hmm. dude in my class was like, hey man, listen to this. Never heard it before. Hit play, he was like, that's a group they call Red S's. Oh yeah. I was done. Changed my life. That was the first time I ever heard Go-Go. Yeah, uh, oh. Ever. Okay. So once <laughs> I'm playing, you know, Rick James and yeah. Mandrill and all this kind of stuff. And, but you heard that. But when I heard I heard that pocket. Yeah. It was a rap, yo. That's Red S's. That that was the first thing I ever heard was Red S's on a cassette tape. 1979, maybe 1980. So from then, I was just like, give me, give me mm. let me get some more. So all regular music at that point got pushed to the side. Yeah. I'm at home every night. So playing. that go that go go to the whole day. Yeah, so by the time I hit high school, I'm like, playing the drums. I'm, I'm, I'm really playing the drums now. So that's when I got in my first go go band in 1982. Okay. It was a band called Eastside Band. Okay. And a lot of, matter of fact, 
Walker Reds from the Walker Reds project yeah. with the Congo play. We was both in that. We both went to the same high school. Okay. And uh, we was both tenth graders, and we got in a band called Eastside Band. Mm -hmm. And you know, playing at the high school functions and all that kind of stuff. The, 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 the block parties and you know that was really my start. That was fun. That was a summertime thing you were yeah, doing, you know, yeah, bands yeah. and neighborhood bands and yeah, the go go the go go all mean. Yeah. The go go mean. So you did all that mainly coming up in high school with the music. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. So after let me say, hmm, when you start producing music, am I going too fast? Yeah, that came, yeah, that probably came almost a decade later. A decade later, yeah. all right, all right, feel so. Let me slow down. Let me, let me relax. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving too fast. Let me relax. All right. So just fill me in a little bit on the 10-year uh, uh, thing before the producing, because we're going to get into the music producing. Right. But we're still going to stick with the band and, you know, everything that you was doing in the meantime, between time. Well, like I said, you know, I was... I ate, slept, and drank go go music okay. in the 80s. That was it. That was outside of going to school and doing what my parents needed me to do. Mm -hmm. That was it. I went, you know, I was at go go's every weekend. Every weekend. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'm like probably 15, 16, yeah. 15, 16. Yeah. Wasn't driving. You know, used to go up Forsville skate rink because I, I lived in Forsville, so. Oh, okay. He used to go up there when Reds and the boys and them would play up there and EU would play up there <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, as I got a little older, you know, I started driving at 16. You know, then I was able to actually go to other places, right? I started going, right? I started going to the Go-Go's and that's when I really started getting exposed to EU and Mass Extinction, Peacemakers and all them bands from way back in the day. and. And, and all them bands had all the instruments right. that you can think of. And exactly. if you would read music, you can have a, what you call a, uh, uh, you can have a, a love for what they doing. Cause they actually and appreciation. Plan, yeah, appreciation for what they doing because they actually creating a sound. Exactly. A distinct sound, which now that we uh, later in life that, you know, DC is the official Go-Go uh, was the official thing for D.C. So right. back in the 70s, like you said, late 70s, early 80s, that was that was like a beginning of, of, of the Go-Go, the Go-Go sound. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in 1984, mm -hmm. when I was in junior high school, I mean, a junior in high school, a okay. uh, good friend of mine uh, had formed a new band. Eastside kind of broken up. And uh, at that point, so I got in a new group called Icy Hot. And Icy Hot was put together by a good friend of mine. And uh, I still was the youngest kid in the group. But anyway, long story short, yeah. uh, we ended up putting out a record called Holla at Me that actually got picked up by a major record label, Island Records. We were actually. I was told we were the yeah. first go-go group to get signed to a major, major label. record okay. label. Okay. It was Capital EMI at the time. So wow. Shot I, video, all that kind of stuff. I'm only 17, still wow. in high school. You know, so I'm starting to get that taste of like, oh yeah, I, you know, yeah, I can really do, do this. this. I, I can do, do this. this. You know what yeah. I mean? And you know, that's where that's it went. major too now. Yeah. 17. I was 17. Icy hot. Uh, record label. Music video. Yep. Oh man. And this is the beginning of like when videos was yeah, first yeah, coming out, yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So uh, we did that. That kind of carried on, got out of high school. And once I got out of high school in 85, mm -hmm. hip hop was kind of taking off. Yeah, you had, I'm gonna give you those, some of those little uh, Hip hop groups that was that was really taking off back then. Of course, LL was taking off back mm -hmm. then. You know what I'm saying? Rock the Bells was yep. 82, 83, 84, something mm -hmm. like that. Rock the Bells was 85, 80, 45, 85, I think, somewhere around 88. So you still had uh, Eric B, Rock Cam, maybe. 
with, uh, with Lil Ron. KRS One. Lil Ron will die when he sees it because he know Rakim is my favorite rapper in the world. In the world. To this day. To this day. To this day. Yeah, Eric B. Rakim. So those, like you said, hip hop was taking off. Hip hop was taking with off. Those, with those pioneers. Yep. Yeah. So I was kind of torn because, you know, I was born and raised, mm -hmm. DC playing Go Go, that was, you know, that was it. Mm -hmm. But now this new music has got yeah. my attention and got my ear. Grandmaster Flash. You know? And I wasn't no rapper. <laughs> but you love the music. But I love the music. Yeah. So I'm gearing to, I'm looking at Jam Master J. I'm looking at, you know, uh, 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 can't forget the DJ's name who played the one for uh, Grandmaster D from Houdini. Uh -huh. You know, AJ Scratch from Curtis Blow. Oh, so I'm looking at these dudes, I'm like, okay, okay. I like that. Right, so I'm working at Bob's Big Boy part time. Which one? On Allentown Road. All right. Right across from Andrew. See, I'm, I'm hip, so when right. you say Allentown Road, Bob's Big Boy, a lot of people don't even know that thing was there, but yeah. I remember, but go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, I'm there, so I'm saving my little money, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And got me, look, I couldn't afford no Techniques 1200s, so I got, look, check this out. So I went and got a pair of Radio Shack belt-driven turntables. Wow. And a little Radio Shack mixer, because they used to sell them at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm just doing it, ain't, I'm not even trying to scratch or none of that, I'm just like, learning the art of blending records and doing all of that. So I got real interested, had a pair of Radio Shack speakers, and I'm doing house parties. Okay. This house party was major. Back man. in the 80s, yeah. Hey, so I started doing house major. parties like while I was in 11th, going into 12th grade, all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I started getting more gigs, started getting a little more notoriety. Icy Hot broke up. So, uh, I'm just DJing. Probably because after I got out of high school, from 86 to 88, I was just straight DJing. Mm -hmm. All my friends that graduated with me was going to UDC, Howard, Bowie State, Maryland. So, you know, a lot of them was pledging frats. I was doing frat party. Mm -hmm. um, 88 came around, and I got a call from a group called Pure Elegance to play. And I was like, nah, man, I don't play drums no more. I'm DJing, whatever, whatever. But you never lose your first love. So I stopped playing with Pure Elegance. We rocked for about another three years. I'm still DJing. So it's funny because I would like rehearse with the go-go band and stuff all week, do a gig on Friday or Saturday night, and then turn right around and do a DJ gig same night doing with some like double dipping. Best of both worlds. Right. <coughs> <coughs> double dipping. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're doing both. Yeah, so, you know, that's kind of how the 80s went. It was just all about, the, you know, hip-hop, me getting into, starting to really emerge into my DJ career. Mm -hmm. But my go-go career was kind of winding down towards the end of the eight, you know. Because by 91, I was done. I wasn't playing in no, no more go-go bands at all. I was just DJing. So pure, ele pure, pure Elegance kind of broke up. Well, no, they didn't break up, but they didn't. They let me know they didn't need my services no more. Okay. Yeah. So. So what instrument was you playing with? The, with the pure elegance drums. At this point, I'm 100 percent oh, playing drums. drums. Okay, I, okay. Every all the bands and everything was all drums. Right. Uh, yep. DJing, house parties, drummer, pure elegance, going to the go go's. You know what I'm saying? Uh, block parties, house parties, just you know. It was all about the music. That's the 80s. That's the 80s. That was the 80s and the beginning of the 90s for me. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing, man. So that so we 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 filling in a little bit with the, the 10 years before you got to producing. Right. So so uh how did you get your start in producing music? Well, what happened is um Cause I, you made you a major producer now. You may be humble with the situation, but I'm honored to be sitting here with this guy, you know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm glad that I met you, you know, some years ago, but I'm, I'm really honored to be sitting here having this discussion, this interview with, uh, I would call you a legend. I would call you, you know, somebody that's important to the Washington metropolitan DMV area because you, you, you did some great things, some great works. 
you know, but I'm gonna let you tell it. You know, I know a little bit, but I'm gonna let you tell it. So get back to the producing part. All right, well, um, early 90s I got married. My first son was born. And I really had scaled back, like my music, the DJ and stuff, because I couldn't really be out there like that no more. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, my same friend, good friend that I said was in Icy Hot, that I started the group with, mm -hmm. they were dab, him and my cousin were dabbling in some music, you know what I mean? And one day I just happened to stop past their crib okay. just to see what was good. And they had like some studio equipment down there. Okay. Drum machine, keyboards, and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, what y'all doing? It's like, yeah, we working on this, that, and the other, and the third. I was like, oh, that's what's up. That's it's what's mid, up. Mid-90s, maybe? This is probably around 92. 92, okay. About 92. Early 90s, then. Yeah, oh, early 90s. Mm -hmm. They was like, yeah, we, you know, we doing this, that, and the other. I was like, oh, so how does this work? So they started showing me, you know, what they was doing, so forth and so on. And, uh... I was like, that's what's up, that's kind of dope. And they graciously did, like, you want to take it home and mess with it. Okay. So I packed drum, it all up. Drum machine? Or drum machine, keyboard, yeah. and a computer had a program back then called Cakewalk. Cakewalk, okay. Yeah. Um, so I took it and was just messing around trying to figure it out. And I was like, okay, this is cool. And I made a little couple of little rough things because I had never done it before. Right. Playing around with right, it. so I let them hear it, and they was like, "This kind of dope, you know, you know, you should maybe, you know, come on along on alongside us. Okay. We can be a team." <laughs> and because you knew music, and it was family, you okay. know what I'm saying? Yeah, they was family, family right. you know what I mean? So I jumped in, and uh, we started a company called Black Productions, mm -hmm. and this was in '90. Yeah, this had to be in late '92, '93, early '93. I might have some of the dates a little wrong, but. Mm -hmm. um, we just started working on music, and then the next thing you know, we were like, we need to go find some artists. We're going to make this production company. Da, da, da. This is the 90s when things is really popping off in R&B and hip-hop music. Okay. So uh, we would go up to, uh, uh, what was the name of that studio? Horizon Studios up in Capitol Heights. It was back there. It was the big studio in D.C. Okay. Where all of the like, people went. So we had some rented some studio time up there to do some work. Long story short. Hold on. We ain't in no rush. Long oh, okay. story short. We're going to keep a short story short or whatever. Now, you said the big studio in Washington, D.C., Capitol Heights, or whatever, whatever. Yeah. Give me a few names that was... that, was, that uh, you know. This is where Chucky Thompson used to do all his work. Chucky's the, from D.C. Okay. He did Biggie, Mary J. Blige. Chucky, you know, Chucky, yeah. salute Chucky, he's pro probably, no, not probably, the <laughs> biggest producer to ever come out yeah, of Yeah, I ain't want you to skip past that, right. you know what I mean? Like so, you said, drop right. some names on this thing. Yeah, so Chucky, used to do, yeah, yeah. he used to do a lot of his work out of that studio. Uh, back before they blew up, mm -hmm. Genuine used to work in that studio. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of local people used to do their stuff before they blew up, so blew to up. speak. Okay. So... We were in there trying to cut demos, and matter of fact, Chucky was in another room working on a session. Mm -hmm. This was in probably 94 now, I'm fast forwarding a little bit. So this is in 94, he was working on a session, and they had a, a lounge. And in that lounge was all these different rappers. It was like a posse record they was working on. Mm -hmm. So he had all these rappers and stuff in there. We, we had, they had a back room. And anybody that remember Horizon will know that they had the big room in the front, the little room in the back. We was in the little room in the back just working on tracks. And we was out in the hallway, and this female was in there rhyming. Mm -hmm. I was like, she is dope, yo. Mm -hmm. So I introduced myself. We got to talking. I said, well, look, if, when y'all having a break, come on back to the back where we at. <laughs> so she came to the back and I played a couple of tracks for her. Yeah. And she was like, okay, okay. So then we left the back and we went out to my car where I had a whole bunch of more stuff. So we was just listening to music, listening to music and she was flowing over the music and we exchanged numbers. Okay. At this point, you know, I had a little uh, studio set up in my apartment and I was staying uh, down on Brinkley Road back at the time. So. Mm -hmm. Um, had a little studio uh, set up there, and uh, 
we started working and then we had a little, uh, what do I want to call it? We was over in, off 50th Street, Northeast. My, my partner, his name's Lonnie. Shout out to Lonnie. Uh, we had put a little studio in his basement. We got a little small loan to get some, some real studio equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had this girl come over there and we was working on demos with her and so forth and so on. And then uh, through her, we met like a whole bunch of other rappers. Okay. So we had, we was building like our own little Motown, if you will. Okay, in DC. In DC, and everybody was repping DC. You know, we was like, you know, so we were working on a sound and we had it. It was kind of a Google influence sound. But anyway, um, one thing, um, let me back up. We weren't quite sure where to go, but it was, I'm going too fast, yeah, sorry. Take, take time. We got the three of us were called Black Productions. It stood for Bam, my, my uh, friend Lonnie, mm -hmm. and then my cousin, his name is Kate, B-L-A-K, Bam, Lonnie, and Kate. And that's what the Black stood uh, for. Okay. So we were black productions. So um, my cousin Caitlin was a communications major from Howard University. Mm -hmm. So he knew a lot of people in the music business. Okay. So I was kind of the creative end. Lonnie was kind of the creative slash business end. And then my cousin was the straight business end. Okay. So um, long story short, we did a demo on this girl that we had met that, you know, that, that, that we night, met that, that night. night at the studio, yeah. And he was like, I got some folks that's working for labels that I went to school with at Howard. So back then, we just sent the cassette off. Mm -hmm. And just so happens, the A&R at MCA Records was from DC, went to school with him. So she immediately connected with the DC vibe. Okay. And then like within a week, she flew down here to meet the artist. And within probably six weeks, we had a production deal at MCA Records. First time out the gate. Mm. So the A and R, the A and R lady name. Would you remember her name? Yeah, her name was Nicole Bernard. Nicole, Nicole Bernard. Yeah, her name was Nicole Bernard. And so right out the gate, that don't happen for most people. You know what I'm saying? To just click like that. So, so the, young, the young lady that that we we speaking on as far as the uh, the artist, mm -hmm. what was her name? Nonchalant. Nonchalant. Okay, we are gonna get into Nonchalant because yeah. a lot of people may not know who she is. But shout out to Nonchalant. And, What's up, uh, Nan? Nah? <laughs> and she definitely was a skater. I remember Nonchalant being a skater. Right. We we get into that. For good. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's crazy because we worked on you know so Nicole was like, I'm feeling what y'all doing, y'all got a different sound, you know, whoop de whoop. And so was this, was this the, not to cut y'all, I'm sorry, was this the five o'clock in the morning? This is the, this is the, the, the creation of, of it. Of the five o'clock yeah. in the morning, all right. Yeah. That, that, that was major for DC. Yeah, that, that Five o'clock in the morning, yeah. and it had a video. Right, and down on Bennett Road. Bennett Road, yeah, yeah you know, never forget that. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead. So, uh, we were working, you know, like I said, first time out the gate, we didn't just like get a credit on an album. They gave us a production deal, meaning y'all overseeing the whole album. Mm. So, we, we dug in, took us about close to a year to put everything together. Mm -hmm. So 95, uh, it was time to drop the record. The way I got the story, I wasn't there, but the way I got the story was they were looking at dropping a, 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 a song as the first single and it wasn't five o'clock. Okay. But I heard that, you know, some heavyweights, and again, I can't substantiate, it's just what I heard. Right that Biggie heard somebody playing five o'clock in the MCA offices oh. and was like, y'all need to put that record out. Mm -hmm. And that kind of swayed them to release five o'clock as opposed to what they were going to release prior to that. And the rest is history. Five o'clock came out, uh, five o'clock in the morning, where you going to be outside on the corner. That, that song went gold. Yeah, we ended up doing close to 800,000 units with that record. Wow. Yeah, so instantly she became a, a hit. A stop. Yeah, a stop. You know what I'm saying? Hit. So, <clears throat> and we were fortunate enough to, like, you know, go on a roll with her. And so a lot of the, that kind of plugged us into the industry as mm -hmm. the dudes who produced that record and all that kind of stuff. 
and that was a that was a strong run for us. You know what I mean? Yes, and indeed. so from there, <clears throat> you know, we were able to get additional work. Uh, and uh, but after the first album, we kind of parted ways with Nan. Uh, she kind of went another way. Okay. We went in a different direction. So we brought in some. Uh, still was trying to develop local talent mm -hmm. and uh, after probably a couple of years of trying music was going through some funny stuff we did some regional stuff some local stuff but we never did nothing to the magnitude, extent, the magnitude yeah, yeah, of five yeah, o'clock so <clears throat> around uh, close to 2000 we as a as a company black productions mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, we kind of run our course. I got you. You know what I'm saying? We have been together for like six years, almost seven years. And people, you know, we just kind of went our separate ways. Well, it was kind of hard for DC artists to kind of break. Through. Oh, very hard back then because yeah, we, wasn't, yeah. we wasn't respected. We wasn't respected at all. At all. It wasn't popping the sound. Nope. Right. The, the, the actual rapping of an artist wasn't catchy enough for. Right. Mainstream hip hop. And you say DC, first thing they was like, oh, that's just go go. That's just go. That's just how we was looked at. So it was very hard for DC. They, they put us in the box. It's hard now. It was even harder back then. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They put us so, in the box. They, yeah. put, they put DC in the box, the rappers in the box, and most of the rap that rappers was doing was to a slight go go beat. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's what we knew. That's what right. we grew up on. Right. And, um, some of it took a hold, like 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 the Go Go record with uh, EU and doing the butt with yeah. Spike Lee. Some you know certain uh, certain rap songs, I mean certain Go Go songs took hold with rap. They kind of mixed it sooner or later. with you Salt and Pepper, you know, right. shake that shake thing. that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Grace Jones, right? Grace pull Jones, up, uh, pull up to pull the up. no um, slave to the river. slave to the river. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That was. With the Congo right. and things of that nature, but again, for straight rapping, that was hard. So that that nonchalant thing, that was that was that was major. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know that 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 set in place for a lot of things. If I can jump one little of thing course, real quick. Yeah. A few years after all of that, mm -hmm. I was talking to a record exec, and I asked him that question. I said, uh, "Why do you think it is that?" Hip hop took off the way it did, and Go Go never did. <laughs> and he gave me an answer that made a whole lot of sense. What was that? And I share this now when people ask me that question. Okay. He said, Con "Consumers who buy music and listen to music love what they can emulate. Uh... That's the key." He said, "Cause in '84." 83 he said hip-hop was just growing yeah. and go-go was just growing same time same time they mm -hmm. were neck and neck at one time mm -hmm. and he was like we were kind of wondering which one was going to break out mm -hmm. and he said but the, the, the thing that hurt go-go was you could not capture that live sound oh. on a studio record uh. and had the same effect it has the same effect yeah. with the call and response in the crowd he said and People listening to Gogo, -Go, he said Gogo -Go was good, was heavy down south. Mm -hmm. People up north didn't really care for it, mm -hmm. but he said people down south in Atlanta and all places, Florida, where they like the party, they love Gogo -Go music down there. Right. But he said it's so different. So to speak, so you mid to late eighties, I was hardcore. I really, you know, I wasn't really going to Gogo -Go as much at this point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was hardcore. Especially Eastside. Eastside was my hangout in the Metro Club. Because <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. So every Thursday. Yeah. Every Thursday I was in the Metro Club. Yeah. So some of them jokes you seen at the Metro Club was uh, pretty sure you seen some of the drug boys down there. Yep. Because <laughs> yep. the 80s was pop. Yeah. You know that for sure. Shout out. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. King of DC, we already know who that was. Right. We leave that alone. <laughs> King of DC. So Eastside, the DJs down there, you 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 knew some of the DJs down there. Eastside? I didn't know them personally, but like uh, the pivotal moment for me, because mm -hmm. I was kind of falling off of music altogether mm -hmm. at this point. You know, I was not really 
playing Google Music, I still enjoyed it. Enjoyed it, yeah. and and this this point, I was just straight RE. That's just, <laughs> that was that was the only band I was interested in. Right around '87, '88. Um, so I was down, like I said, I was down in the Metro Club every Thursday night. Mm -hmm. um, weekends, I was down the East Side, pretty much every Friday night. Uh, and then that's when I got a huge heavy dose of DJ Cool. Mm -hmm. And because he was the DJ down on the east side and the way he used to just tear the club up and that, that, that call and response and it was almost like funk on the mic. And Benny, how Benny, how they would control the crowd. Yeah, yeah. DJ Cool was doing the same thing in the club. Right. So that just, you know, that kind of reignited me to want to get back into these turntables, you know what I mean? Moving the crowd to the party. Yeah, so I kind of got interested, re-interested, instead of just being at the party to being the life of the party in a sense, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I went out and invested, this time, I, you know, not dealing with the Radio Shack turntables, I actually invested in some real turntables, okay. the real mixer, you know, and uh, just started working. Man, and that's how kind of how we rocked out in the '80s, man. Then it just transitioned up in the in, up into the '90s, mm -hmm. and then you know uh, that kind of segue. I kind of did that all the way up until I met Nonchalant for real. Okay. Yeah. Mid '90s, early mid '90s, yeah. like that. Nonchalant. Yeah. Because yeah. back then, as as you probably. Uh, you, my, you know, we peers, age-wise, right. right. you know, from, you know, I just, that era was a very materialistic era. <laughs> and, 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 and everybody wanted to, The latest know. fashion. Right. So, so, so we, I love that fashion piece, we get to talk about that fashion. And so what 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 was some of them clothes that you was wearing out there? Some of them kids and stuff is wearing them, them clothes today. I know it's gone you know, full circle. I, I seen a Sergio Chichini t shirt. My man at, at, at DJ D cousin, mm -hmm. my man Daryl Daryl Stoudemire. Mm -hmm. He give you all the, the Brooks, the Sergio Chichini. The he, he give you all that now in the 2000s, right. 2020. So yeah. those are some of the name brands. Yeah, I got I, I got. A whole scrapbook full of go go flicks and club pictures from back in them days. And for me, it was about feel like I was, I just had to have feel like everything back then. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't like the, uh, uh, the sweater or the, the big bomber jacket or whatever, you know what I mean? I yeah, just, I had, I had, yeah, yeah I had every, almost every color, every style mm -hmm. that was just. Me personally, you know what I mean. So uh, that was my thing. I used to stay up racking a job mm -hmm. and finding the, the newest sweatsuits that would come out and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, that was that was a fun time. You know, that was a fun time. But like I said, uh, as we came to the '90s, things started changing, and you know, I started losing friends, and you know, it was out out there. And, you know, just you know, play like I said. I started having kids, and you know, so I had to change yeah. my my thinking. You know, plus I'm getting older. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, I mean, you had to, that's a great life experience coming up, 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Yeah. So then you move you move up to hold on 90s. Was 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 that when you kind of Start DJing at the rink or the home move too fast again. Nah, I didn't move start. Too fast again. Yeah, the nineties. <laughs> um, for me, it was like the mid nineties is when the nonchalant and the music thing jumped off. Okay, that's the, the music. Producer. Right. So, so was you traveling at all oh. with the, with the uh, music? Yeah, it was. Okay. I was because uh, you know back in them days, I was in New York a lot. Okay. I was in New York a lot because back in them days we had to you had to market and shop you you know so you spend. Right time in the studio making music, making tracks, making beats, but then you had to go up to New York to try to market them and sell them and get on projects and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, we hop in the car, drive up there, spend a the whole day. It's the Tupac era. Yeah. Kinda. 
Kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. It's Tupac that, probably yeah. was just sparking back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is around that era. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was when, like, it was just so many, it was so much money back in them days. Mm -hmm. Because the labels was just really, you know, this is the, the, the bad boy era. Okay. You know, the shiny suit era. <laughs> the, 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 in the club with the you know with the bottles era you know what I mean yeah so everything is about expect you know just being over the top yeah you know what I mean so you had to it was a lot of competition you know you had to really get up there and and and, and, and work your craft and, you know got on some remixes got some work you know so forth and so on but then I don't know what year it was but then all of a sudden it was like it all came to a screeching halt Mm. And I'm gonna tell you when that was. Mm. And they talked about it. Uh, it's a documentary I was just watching. Mm. But that was when Napster came out. Nap what was what's Napster? Napster was the first file sharing service ever on the internet. Okay. When Napster came out, people started sharing music. It was before iTunes, before Spotify, mm. but before all of that, okay. this was like, it might have been late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So when that started happening, people stopped buying CDs. People stopped, you know, uh, spending that kind of money because they yeah. was foul shit. So record companies was, oh, they, was losing. they was losing money. So they was downsizing and all that kind of stuff. So work got cut, scarce. Cut the budgets and all that. It, it became real cutthroat, and you know, it just became things became real lean. Mm -hmm. I put it that way. Uh, so trips out to LA to record like I used to do, and Atlanta and New York and all that kind of stuff. Them things were just Cancel. dried up. Right. You know what I'm saying? And you know, I could have kept chasing them, but when you again, you got a family. Mm -hmm. That you gotta, you know, Support. try to take care of and all of that, right? And that was to me, that was probably the beginning of a dark time, real dark time. Okay. Tell um, me a little bit about that. Well, off air before we, uh, I mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, Talk a little bit about. Yeah. About. So, slow down. Uh -huh. So, 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 we did talk a little bit off air. And we still keeping it 100. We still keeping it real. For sure. For sure. 100. percent You had to come back from the screeching halt with the music business and the producing business to come back to your craft as far as DJ. Right. Okay. So we, let's take it from there. Right. So probably around, I want to say, 2002, 2003. I pretty much. I think 2003 was my last trip to California. Okay. I had just done a song uh, for, uh, you remember the movie Biker Boys? Of like the motorcycle? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. well I did some some work in in that movie. Okay, soundtrack. And, uh, soundtrack okay. And, and the score of the movie. Wow. Um, if you ever watch it again, it's a, a scene where they were doing a, the bike wash. They were bike washing all the motorcycles. Yeah. All the music that's playing in that scene of the movie is me. Wow. Yeah. Every note, every beat, every everything. Wow. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and I had, I had just done some work for uh, the New York Undercover soundtrack. I mean, the TV show New York Undercover. Yeah. I had done some work off of that. Um, I did some work on uh, Dave Chappelle Half Baked, his first movie. I remember that. I, I, had, I did some stuff on that soundtrack. Wow. You know, so I know, not that I take that back. It was scoring. The movie. It was part of the movie. It wasn't. It didn't make the soundtrack, but part of the movie. but it was part of the movie. Right. Yeah. Um, but anyway, all of that was kind of the work just wasn't where it was. Mm -hmm. So you know, I had to. You know, when you out and you sending money home is one thing. Right. But if you out and you ain't and you ain't sending no money home, that's something different. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I had to, mm. and not you know, and. I'm, you know, I was missing a lot of, you know, not spending time. the quality yeah, time yeah, with yeah, the kids the and yeah. all that kind of stuff like you're supposed to. Right. So, you know, I came back home and, uh, I mean, not, not that I was gone that much, you know what I'm saying? But I was spending more time at home. Yeah, you traveling for work. Right. I mean, yeah. I was spending more time at home, but uh, I'm still looking for that 
that that that that level of success that I had kind of experienced early a few years mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. and um that's why you know I tell people it's kind of like crack almost you mm. know because you know when you first if you're fortunate enough to kind of be successful at something mm -hmm. you get a certain rush a certain euphoria because you like made it to the top of your game right. and I spent the better part of almost a decade trying to chase that dream. chase get that feeling again mm -hmm. you know what I mean and at the expense of neglecting things that were important right you know what I'm saying so uh that kind of will catch up to you sooner or later and it caught up with me. And uh, next thing you knew, you know, the house that I had bought and the, 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 all the things that I had put, you know, all, all my work and, and efforts into mm -hmm. were suddenly gone. Mm -hmm. You were losing, th losing things slowly and surely? Slowly and surely, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, next thing you know, I found myself living in a hotel. You know what I'm saying? I found myself uh, at times using public transportation. Mm -hmm. I found myself, you know, it's like complete 180 from what, used to. what I was used to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you have to uh, do some self assessments, okay. you know, and it was during that time that, uh, let me back up just a little bit, but even during this time, which I did talk about was I used to be a football coach. Okay. You know, co coach pop on a boys club with my kids and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's the time that you were spending with the kids. That's the time, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You know, spending time and I was a coach and uh, a friend of mine who was also a coach uh, let me know that um, he knew I was DJing and at this point, I had come back. I was DJing in some local clubs and stuff like that. Trying and to make ends meet. Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to make ends meet. You know, trying what I mean? to survive. Right, trying to survive. Wrong man at this time. Exactly. Family. Exactly. You know, you know, been left the nest. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Big boy got to put the big boy pants on. Exactly. So, um, a, a friend of mine who's a fellow coach, and you know, Coach Tim, Tim Taylor. Shout them out, what's up? Um, he said that he, you know, he came here, told me, he said, look, I'm working on something. If I'm, you know, if we go through, would you be interested in coming on being a DJ? And I was like, well, what you got? And he was like, um, working on opening up the old Crystal Skate. Okay. I was like, okay. I said, Crystal Skate? I said, I used to go there in 85 when I was in high school. <laughs> and it literally had been 20 years since, since stepped, I had been in the skate ring. Since I stepped foot in it. <laughs> but at this point, I'm like, it's a payday. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, um. So you took him up on that offer. I took him up on that offer. Yeah. And actually, uh, let's cut this just for a second. Yeah. Um, well, you can edit it out later. I missed, I, I missed a very important part. Okay. Um. So I'm gonna pick it up from when I was staying in a hotel and all that. All right, so, you know, uh, lost my home, lost my, pretty much everything I had worked to establish at that point. Uh, family structure was broken up. Um, and uh, like I said, I found myself living in a hotel just contemplating where life was going to go. And it was at that moment that uh, God put people around me to, to, to strengthen me and to talk to me. And for the first time in my life, I actually began to listen to the, 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 the voices that I thought was just voices, but I come to understand that that was God talking to me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So. Uh, when I was at my absolute worst, absolute rock bottom, I was just ready to just cash in at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, that was when I just, just decided to I, to say, basically, I quit, God, I'm giving it to you. And 
that was when everything changed for me personally. And so the moment that you submitted and gave your thoughts and all your uh, what you call willingness to, to, to even survive, you gave it to God. I gave it. I said I'm I'm not trying to do it my way no more because right. my way stinks. It ain't. I mean, it's got me living in a hotel mm -hmm. with not too. You know, I had nothing after where everywhere I've been. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I started going to church. I started reading the Bible. I started changing my thought patterns. I start, and it wasn't overnight. You know what I'm saying? This is 2005. Okay. Um, I'm putting my life there. I'm I'm just learning to uh, submit and stop trying to do things my way and in my own strength. Mm -hmm. So as these things started to happen, without me realizing it, things were starting to change in my favor. But you know, it's just not like overnight, like boom, here everything is right. But a little bit at a time, things was changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a football coach, and Tim Taylor, who was also a football coach, had kind of informed me that he was getting ready to work on reopening Crystal Skate. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been in Crystal Skate for 20 years. I knew nothing about the skate community other than what I remember. <laughs> When I was 18, yeah. because back in them days, I went to the skate rink because that's just what everybody did. Right. I wasn't brought up in the skate community like a, so many skaters are. Right. It wasn't no, you know, it wasn't something that I did with my parents or anything like that. You know what I mean? I went because the girls were there yeah. and that type of thing. But at the, at the same time, I'm like, well, this is an opportunity to make some money. So. And he, at this point, I was in the church. Um, I was playing a lot of gospel music. And back then, actually, my name was DJ Bam, the gospel DJ. Okay. And uh, he was like, I'm doing a gospel night. So I want you to come up here and do the gospel night. Are you interested? I was like, sure. So um, this is 05. Yeah, this is 05. Mm -hmm. I used to, so I started, when he reopened Crystals, it was called the Lightscape. Right. If you remember. I um, remember that. I was doing the gospel skate on Friday nights from 10 to 1 and I started to uh, you know meet people and things like that and then uh, he didn't have a DJ for Sunday night he's like can you DJ Sunday night I was like I don't know nothing about <laughs> skate music dude you know what I'm saying nothing at all right and this was before Sunday became a popping night. This right. is in 05. Thursday was the night back then. Mm -hmm. So I did Sunday, played some whack music, had no idea what I was doing, but it was a paycheck. Yeah. Eventually, I think I did it for maybe like a month. And then I just decided one Thursday, I ain't have nothing to do. Right. So I said, I'll go up here to the ring. That was the first time I met DJ D, DJ Derek. And the same way I felt when I heard DJ uh, Cool play it on the east side yeah. 18 years before was the same way I felt when I heard DJ D play that Thursday night. He played music that I remember from the Quiet Storm and, you know, music that I grew up on. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so this is what they play on Thursdays? I was like, I can get into this. That's what's up. <laughs> and then I'm watching the skaters with the smooth move in, you know, because on right. gospel skate, people's falling. They got on brownies, all that kind of stuff. Right. But, but on Thursdays, I was watching, like, I probably was watching skaters. you and didn't even know it. <laughs> Some skaters. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm like, these dudes is smooth as I don't know what. That. I fell in love instantly. Right. I mean, it was instant. And I was just like, I want to do that. So I went to Tim and I was like, yo, what I got to do to do that? He was like, well, you know, we'll see. So I'm, you know, I started studying. I would come up to the rink every Thursday and I had a pad and a pen. <laughs> Real talk. Okay. Every song Derek played, I wrote that joint down. Every single one. Hmm. I would take my phone, I would start videotaping like the floor. Right. 
and watch how people was dan uh, skating off of the type of, you know, different forms off of different type of music. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, I still didn't understand it, but I was just trying to document as much as I could. Cause I said, if I'm gonna do this, I gotta understand it. Right. So that went on probably for better part of almost two years mm -hmm. or more, maybe even a little more. And I think by that time, Norman had started doing Sundays. Okay. So I started coming on Sundays. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to Dirk on Thursdays. I'm listening to Norman on Sundays, taking notes, listening to music. And, and when I went back in, by then, like I said, I have been DJing since I was 16. So almost everything that they had, I had my album collection already at home. Mm. So I'm just, you know, but I still didn't quite understand yeah, how, to put it together. how to put it all together in the culture. Right. So <clears throat> I was never confident enough to try to emulate it publicly. Right. I'll make little tapes at home and all that kind of stuff and still go into the rink. And then, um, that continued on probably until like 2009. I got the job. I think it, whatever year it was, Ali opened up C, open Seabrook or took over Seabrook. Yeah. Uh, ten stacks. Ten. Uh, <laughs> hit me up. Was like he looking for a gospel DJ up Seabrook. Okay. So that's how I got in the door at Seabrook. Oh, okay. That's how I got it because at this point. Uh, the light skate had closed again. Had closed again, and <laughs> USA had opened up, reopened the rink as Temple Hills Skate Palace, right. and they kind of eliminated the gospel night in the beginning. Right. So there was really no need for me to to be there. Continue DJing. So I, I left, and then so I started doing the gospel up at uh, Seabrook, Seabrook. Mm -hmm. and then um, all the while I'm still going to sessions wherever I can find them. Wherever I knew Norman or Derek, whoever was playing, because I'm still studying, listening. But once I started DJing at Seabrook, that was that, for me, mm -hmm. that was that last hurdle where my confidence got to the point where I, I said, now I think I'm ready. Okay. And that was because two people, DJ Retro Dre okay. and Miss Magic, mm. who just uh, recently passed away. Rest in peace, Miss Magic. Mm -hmm. Um, when I first got there, I was doing a gospel skate, but I same thing, I would come and I would hang around at Dre's sessions. And he and I had kind of a similar conversation because he didn't know me. Right. I didn't know him, he didn't know my background, he didn't know nothing. And I made it a point that when I kind of went to Seabrook, mm -hmm. I wasn't gonna mention nothing about myself. Nothing about the production. I said, because anything I do, as a skate DJ, mm -hmm. I wanted to be off of my work mm -hmm. presently, right. what I'm doing, not anything I did in the past. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't want, I didn't want nobody saying, oh yeah, that's the producer, that's that, that. No, I said, I'm gonna come in as that dude that don't nobody know, mm -hmm. don't nobody know nothing about me, and let my work speak for itself. So, I got there and, and Dre was the one who pulled me to the side, like after the sessions or on different sessions, because when he wasn't playing, he was like working the skate room and stuff. Okay. And I used to go down there and just hang out and talk. And let me tell you, he gave me history. Okay. He took it all the way back to the organ at Cal, you know, at, at Cal Around. Right. And 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 I didn't, you know, it was so much I just didn't know. But he gave me a history lesson. Okay. And that went on for almost a year, he would just feed me information. And this person, and that person started doing this. And see that style that he doing, that's this. And see this, that, that. He, you know, and me not being a skater, yeah. he was giving me stuff that was absolutely necessary for me you to get understand. to where I was trying to get yeah, to. Yeah, for you to understand, of course. So I call, to this day, I call him my sensei. Because <laughs> he's the one that schooled me to the game. I wouldn't have never known that. To everything. Mm. And then the coup de grace, he did something that nobody had ever done for me before. What was that? I guess when he thought I was ready, one day I came into the ring and he had a CD case this thick. Okay. Hundreds of CDs in. He said, here. He said, take this home and 
copy these CDs. These is the records that you gonna need mm. if you wanna keep going doing this. In this direction, wow. And that was when, I mean, he gave me like everything. I was gonna ask you some questions about how did you even know certain things to play with? I'm moving too fast. No, nah, we moving, good, bro. But now nah, I want you to get back to that. But I definitely wanted to know. I'm curious. But we'll get to that because I was like, how did you even know what to even play? But now you just answered my question. So, so Dre. Dre, and then uh, Dre was from a DJ perspective. Yeah. He was schooling me to the game as a DJ, and Miss Magic was schooling me as a skater, even though I didn't skate. Yeah. She was like, yeah, you know, she was literally like she was giving me skate instructions, but I wasn't on a skate. Do the things you needed to know. Right, and she was like, you know, most skaters do this, and skate, and if you see a skate, you know, little things, she was like, just I'm gonna let you, just a tidbit of some of the stuff she would tell me. She said, if you play a record, and you see a skater put his arms behind his back, she was like, change the record. <laughs> that means they not feeling yeah. I was like, wow, really? You know, it's little stuff like that. Yeah. And, and just those little nuggets, over time just added up mm -hmm. on top of my genuine love of that era of music because mm -hmm. I grew up listening to the choir storm I grew up listening to the, all that kind of music so and as a believer in the faith and the Christian and, and, and my loyalty and I, I was not definitely was adamant about not compromising Which you already type of music I was going to play right. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I'm done with the ratchet music. I'm done with a lot of music that I used to play. Mm -hmm. So it was like a perfect storm. I was like, I can still play the type of music that I love, that 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 R&B, you know, I'm a musician. Mm -hmm. So my favorite groups and bands are Earth, Wind & Fire, Stevie Wonder, the Osley Brothers, even before I got into the skate scene. Mm -hmm. So to have an outlet where I can play that kind of music, and then everything else that go along with it, it just, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was just like digging and researching, whatever. So any, so what I started doing was, I would sneak secular music into my gospel sessions. You know what I'm saying? I would play like a Kirk Franklin record, and then I would play uh, uh, Mid, uh, Midnight You, because it's an instrumental. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And or I would play something else and then I'd slide in some Love Unlimited Orchestra or an uh, instrumental of uh, 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 Curtis Mayfield. You know, I wouldn't play the words, but I would play the, you know, and uh, uh, people was just was vibe to it. And, and, and it made that. So my kind of moving up a little more to how I captured my current day. Um, the Monday Night DJ uh, took a leave of absence or and, and uh, just had other obligations. He stopped doing Mondays. Mm -hmm. And I know Monday was a practice night for everybody at Seabrook. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Let, let that be known. <laughs> yeah. Monday was a practice night. So I took Monday night over and I was like, it ain't going to be a Monday night practice night for long. You know, not if I got anything to say about it. So, you know, I would just go extra hard to try to have people not just look at it as a practice night, but like this is a real night where we can actually roll. And uh, so, I, but I, it wasn't just straight because the crowd was kind of mixed. It would be some seasoned skaters, some young skaters. And uh, so I was playing, trying to develop a format, trying to develop a formula, trying to do you know something that worked. So the vibe in them, I said, okay, so early on, we're gonna come in with the seasoned DMV music. So towards the middle, we're gonna kind of transition a little bit, bring it up to something that the, you know, that the younger skaters can vibe to. And then we're gonna always close out with strong with the home team vibe. And it started catching on. I don't know why. I don't I'm, know who said I'm, what. I'm no. tell you why. No, we ain't gonna skip past all that. <laughs> and I'm not gonna let you skip past all that, though. It, I would say this. And do you recall 
maybe the first platform you played with the local skate DJs? I can't say I do. I, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to say the community skate mm. that we had in Shake and Bake, yeah. Baltimore. Oh, and Baltimore? I, it was in Baltimore. Community skate, Shake and Bake, Baltimore. At that particular time, it was about four or five DJs that uh, was playing together, and you were one of the DJs. So I'm, I'm assuming maybe Paul, Ashley, you, uh, I'm not sure the other three, two, two or three DJs. But if I'm not mistaken, that was maybe the first time you played. It probably could have. Yeah, yeah, you probably don't remember. It's, it's a blur. It's this, this history I remember. And it was a, it, it, you did this free. Everybody, right, everybody, I remember, yeah, okay, er, I everybody that played, it was a give back to the skate community at DMV. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was called the Community Skate. And um, and the DJs uh, played. And uh, if, I'm, if, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time you even played outside of uh, Seabrook. Seabrook, yeah. right. So that that's why I said, you say, man, well, I don't know how they, I think your buzz came with a lot of other people, other than skaters, I'm gonna say with the DJs, is the first time you played with them on that platform outside of SeaWorld. Okay. And uh, then you can move forward from there, like you said, as far as the, uh, the Monday nights and they just start coming. But I would say that's when, uh, you know, you, you kind of got uh, out of the box of Seabrook and that Mondays. I do remember that. Yeah, yeah I remember Seabrook, that. out of okay. the box of that Mondays, because yeah. after that, you kind of sold, you know, to me, and you just kind of, you know, became sought after, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, as a DJ. And and, you and, probably and, was already doing your thing. You was doing your thing. But when you got outside of Seabrook, you got more exposure. And then your name, who was this guy? Right. It's DJ Van. Oh, man, he play up there on such and such on Mondays. Oh, I gotta go check him out because he was cranking up such and such, and yeah, your name got sorted out after, right after that okay. with the season skaters anyway. Right. Yeah. And then I, uh, and 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 this is no. Shit. I love everything I play, mm -hmm. and you know I'm adapt. You know I adapt to all my environments. I love what I do, and uh, but I wouldn't be transparent and be. You keeping it 100, which is what we agreed to do. Mm. That 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 season vibe is gonna always be, you know, yeah. number one hit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, which leads me to <laughs> uh, about four years ago, I was having, you know, I I. I Love playing a season format, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the classics. Um, I love that format, I love playing in that vibe, uh, but I don't really have a platform to do it on a regular basis, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I've done a few parties here, a few parties there, but I said, this is something that's just, I love it, right. you know? I got my platform for Mondays where I kind of play more of a national vibe. Mm -hmm. So, one of my best friends, uh, well actually he didn't know about it in the beginning, but I just, and I gotta believe God gave it to me, um, I was like, you know, how can I just express what I feel musically to others other than just myself? Right. And that's what sparked the idea for On The Wood Radio. Okay. Because I said, well, if I can't play in the ring, I can play in a place where people, no matter where they are, can enjoy classics that may not even be played, you know, in the yeah, ring yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I was like, but I'm still not, uh, I said, I can't do this by myself, nor do I want to do it by myself. 
because my confidence level still, even to this day, right. you know what I'm saying? I'm not, I don't, I don't have the, 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 the you know, that wherewithal to be like, yo, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, you know. Anybody that knows me, I tell you in a heartbeat that uh, I got a shout out, Storm and Norman, that's the OG to me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I said, there's one person that I know that loves music and like digs music the way that I do and studies music the way that I do and just digs and digs and digs. And you know who that is? Who's that? Lil Ronald. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, Ronald, I got this idea, bro. He was like, what? I said, man, I want to do this radio show, but you know, I wanted to get to skaters, mm -hmm. you know, where they got a place they can just tune in and hear their favorite skate music. Even if they, you know, if they not at the rink, right. we not, you know, we not doing a whole, we not playing a whole bunch of instrumentals yeah. for, we playing classics, songs, you know, breaking some new music, you know, but everything that we play is skatable. Right. And he was like, I like it. And that was the birth of On The Wood Radio. Okay. And we going on our fourth year now. Mm. And uh, I think up to date, we had probably, I know it's over close to, if not exceeded, I know we're close to 75,000 <laughs> listeners. That's major. Yeah. Mm. So. Um, You're streaming on what platform? We on uh, mixlr.com slash WRS. That's the station. Okay. It's called the Imaginary Radio Station. And it's uh, www.mixlr.com slash WRS. We're on every Tuesday from 7 to 11. And for my skaters who love that good couples music, the last hour and a half of every show is straight couples. Okay. And we, we go in and we pull out, we dig, we pull out records that you like. Because uh, people, it has a message board, right? So people be, man, I ain't heard that since Colorado. Or I ain't heard that since Forsville. Mm -hmm. Or I ain't heard that since whatever, whatever, whatever. And that brings us, you know, joy that we're able to, to, to do that. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So check us out. Um, but yeah, bro, that's kind of where I'm at, you know. Um, but the future holds. I was always looking for that next uh, opportunity. So you got you got relationships with the DMV DJs now. You also was DJing with uh, DJ Goody on Wednesdays up in Seabrook as well. So that was a, a seasoned skater adult type, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we was I was doing first Wednesdays, what we called it Power Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. And we was doing that up until uh, COVID hit. Okay. So once uh, they reopened the rinks, uh, they just decided not to go move forward with that night. So um, that was uh, yeah. So right now I don't have a platform to for any season events inside the actual skate rink because right. you know with the bake still being closed and you know uh, the, the 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 other nights and thing you know there's no real platform where they are but I just choose not to <laughs> right. do it, put it that way okay um <laughs> the, the the right opportunity has not surfaced for me to you know so until then you know we'll just continue to continue to rock out on the radio and if there's any events parties special events or things like that. in fact there's something I can't speak on it right now but there's something gonna be coming up real soon and uh I sh I'll be playing at that event. So you produce? Have you produced any music? Any skate music? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, <laughs> it's funny you say that. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started, uh, you know, really heavy being a skate DJ, I didn't even want nothing to do with music production. I wasn't even producing music at all no, at that point. Records, right? I was just playing records. Mm -hmm. I was just playing records, you know, because um, I was adamant that I wasn't going to two things. The music business had changed so much from when I was in it mm -hmm. during the 90s and early 2000s to where it is now. It's so cutthroat, it's so, 
it's just, I, you know, I was not going to compromise myself for anything or, you know, you almost got to sell your soul completely to be involved in that industry these days. And I like, nah, I don't want a part of it. Not only that, everything that I went through to get me to this point mm -hmm. taught me a couple of valuable lessons that the real things that matter in this world are priceless. Mm -hmm. Family, faith, uh, you know, those type of things. The, the, those things you can't put a price tag on. And I also, uh, you know, I was blessed enough to have restoration in a, in a lot of areas in my life. You know, uh, God bless me with a beautiful wife. Uh, you know, uh, God bless me, you know, to ha have longevity with my parents. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of blessings that I took for granted before mm -hmm. I never, I don't take for granted anymore. Right. So each day, that's why when we got here, you asked me how was my day. I said, I, my day was great. Right. Each day is a great day. That I, you know, that I open my eyes and get out of bed, I'm thankful right. and grateful. And, you know, a lot of people say, you know, bam, you, you know, you a humble dude. I don't try to like be humble, like like I'm going out my way to be humble. Right. I'm just so grateful and appreciative that I got a second chance in life that it just comes across that way. Right. You know, the things that I used to chase, I used to chase uh, status, I used to chase money, I used to chase all these different things when at the end of the day I realized that's not the, 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 the root of who I am. That's not the root of who God made me to be. Right. So I, you know, I'm not looking to be, like I used to strive to be like that producer that everybody wanted to use. I used to strive to be that DJ that everybody wanted. I DJ now just cause I love it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I have a, 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 my own personal motto that some people may know that I say it. I said, I don't care if it's two or 200 or 2,000 people when I play, I'm going to play, you know, mm -hmm. to the best of the God-given ability I have. Because right. it's not about, for me, it's not about how many. I lock in on one person mm -hmm. and see that they having a good time, and I'm going to play my heart out for that one person that's there. That's your fulfill fulfillment. Right. And then, you know, cause that I know I'm giving back and I'm just using my gifts to give somebody else enjoyment. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how I look at kind of everything, you know, and uh So how did how did the black sheep come about? I know you <laughs> you also have a slogan. Who's the black sheep? Yeah. yeah. Well, the black sheep came about because I I told you um earlier that when I first started DJing in the skating ring, uh, I had, I'm not a skater, mm -hmm. don't come from a skate background. When I first started DJing, I wasn't connected with any skaters or, and you know, nobody knew me from yeah. Adam. And I used to constantly hear, he ain't no skater, he ain't gonna never make it as a DJ. Hmm. How he gonna be a DJ and a skater? He, 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 he can't even skate. Or he don't know nothing about skate music. He ain't from here. Da, da, da. Right. You know, all I, I you name it, I heard it. In the, you know. Yeah. So uh I felt alienated. You know what I'm saying? Cause I wasn't, you know, until Dre and Magic kind of pulled me under their wing, and that was 2000. 10 maybe mm -hmm. 2011 but I have been a skate DJ since 2005 right so for all of them that time wow, before so that did. I wasn't really getting no no love it wasn't no hate right. but I wasn't getting no love right. you know um, nobody was like let, let, let me help you get to where you want to be right. let me show you or let me show you, you know so I felt I was like okay I said I guess I'm the black sheep of the, of the skate community and that's where they came from. and that's where they came from and um, I can't remember who said it, but it was a session that I did and I rocked out. Mm -hmm. And a skater was like, 
who's the black sheep? <laughs> and it stuck. And from that point on, that's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. You know, I get love now, but you know, it, it just became my trademark, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I wasn't, in, you know, I, I, and to an extent, I'm not really in like a crew. Right. I'm not in like a clique. I'm cool with everybody. I, I, you know, I try to make sure yeah. that I'm cool with everybody. Right. But there's still times, you know, I still, you know, I, I still move solo, and a lot of, a lot of things I do, a lot of ways I move. Yeah. Well, that's the, it, be, that's the best, the best way to operate. And like you said, you cool with everybody. Yeah, I don't have no. You that's, know. that's the best way to operate in the skate community to be cool. You know, you don't have to like and love everybody. Right. But you can just be cool with everybody. Yeah. So, um, you may not recall, but I know me and you talked for however we met, you know, um, I asked you for uh, a CD or something, you know, give me, give me, give me a CD, because I haven't been to your Mondays or whatever when mm -hmm. you was playing, and um, I said, man, give me a CD, you know, let me make, some, make a couple of CDs, I'm going to let the fellas, which is the firm, right, late right, night right. soul, road crew, whatever. You know, we uh, throwing parties and things of that nature. I said, we left the fellas here. We're going to try to put you on uh, one hour skate parties mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we, we you, matter of fact, I think you sent us an A and a B or two CDs or whatever. Then we, uh, somehow I think Ronald had it and I had it and maybe 10 and all. We all agreed that, you know, hey, we can use this guy. And, and we always was looking to put a new face in the, in a good place, with, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. about DJing. We didn't want to use the same old people, blah, blah, blah. But, um, and I got back with you and I would say, you know, we're going to get you. We're going we're gonna, we're right. gonna, to gonna put I you remember. on something. We're gonna, it's, it's just the timing. It got to be right. The, the skate party got to be right. The time and everything got to be right. But we're going we're gonna to get you. And, um, and we stuck to that. Like you said, that's being cool with you know the people in there you don't have to be in no click or anything like that but just be cool and um you know everything and just work out so i remember those days and that's yeah. like that's the kind of sort of when i met you yeah that was the uh rennie's fish fry uh, of seabrook that okay. was when that was the the, the night when y'all yeah. had me play yeah yeah yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah. We, had we had fun that night we had fun that Rennie night we had fun that night fish fry but you i think i said like i said i know you played up up the bake first yeah. You know what I mean? Then we played, then you did the fish fry situation. Then out of the fish fry, you know, that's when your power, your, 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 your the power your, your, your was, yeah, yeah, that was even formulated. Yeah. You know, everybody, they loved you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. DJ Bam, one and only. You know? So, yeah, bro, it's, it's been a good ride, and, and I'm, I feel like I'm still getting started, so hopefully we got some good stuff on the horizon. So, you got anything else you're working on? on uh, Anything else you want to plug? Well, I know, yeah, we kind of got off, 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 off subject a little bit. That's my fault. I apologize. For nah, that. that's but cool, man. The, uh, you would ask me about making any music. Right. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. And um, so when I first started DJing, I was just playing the records only. And for the most part. But then I started, as Monday nights started ramping up, side of what's going on, I started hearing a lot of tracks and stuff, you know, made by uh, producers, predominantly ones out of Chicago, like uh, Shop Row Style, mm -hmm. DJ T Rail, mm -hmm. uh, folks like that, and um, uh, Dante, Kizo Kane, mm -hmm. and uh, Damo, my man Damo, Damo shout yeah. Damo on the track. <laughs> yeah. So I'm listening to, you know, and I was vibing off this stuff. I was like, this is, you know, but it really reminded me of what I was doing 20, 20 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Going to yeah. classic records and chopping them up and making new new joints out of them. Mm -hmm. So just kind of messing around, I started doing it a little bit and I just gave a couple of beats out to some local DJs and I would go to those sessions and I would hear right. and, see, and see people's reactions yeah. to the tracks that I had given them I was like, okay, <laughs> opportunity, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I uh, just kind of got back into it. I don't do it heavy, yeah. but every now and then, you know, when I feel off, I hear a record 
or if we play an old record on the radio show, I'd be like, ain't nobody chop this up. I can make that up. I'll go in and make a skate beat, whatever, flip it, and I'll send it to, to certain DJs because I know they're going to spin it. And, you know, it gives, for me, it kind of gives me that that little exclusivity, if you will. And you, 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 you make sure you put your name on it, stamp your I name. I didn't in the beginning. Okay. Stamp. But I stamp them now. <laughs> I actually, I actually had a DJ try to come up and give me my own track. Huh? <laughs> Say that ain't so. Yeah. Who's the black sheep? <laughs> that, I hadn't tagged it. Okay. And I was at a session and a DJ played that record. And then, and, and then you know, the and, and, then I, and I went up and dapped them up and they were like, hey, yeah, man, you got this joint? I'll email it to you. I was like, no, nah, I already got it, bitch. <laughs> But you know what? That used to happen with five o'clock too. For real? People used to come up. They'd be like, "Yeah, hey, when on when she was like at her peak." Yeah. Oh man, it was so. It was more DJ. It was not DJ. It was more people who claimed that they produced that record, and a couple of them came up to me and was like, "Yeah, man," or they mans or whatever knew I did it, and would be like, "Yeah, I want you to meet my man, so and so and so. He did five o'clock." I'd be like, "Oh, for real." Oh, that joint is dope. Wait, when'd you cut that joint? Oh, and they just like lying. I'm just sitting. Me and the other dude just like, wow, but you gonna sit here and just lie, you know. <laughs> and finally, they'd be like, Slim, he, he did, did that. And I'd be like. So here we are 20 years fast forward. Okay. History and repeating he, itself. Yeah, he did that. <laughs> That's his track. Yeah. You got a, I don't know, I know you do it. You do a Michael Jackson joint. Do you got anything with Mike? No. Yeah, I did. I did them. I did. I think I did a couple. Mike, of them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I did a, one of them. Another, uh, I got a Stevie Wonder joint too. That's uh, that's popping right now. Okay. It's kind of a cool down joint, but it's. It, I got a lot. Matter of fact, a lot of music. Matter of fact, yeah. It, to DJ the point Bang. where I actually started uh, on Bandcamp. I don't know if it is, it's a website called Bandcamp.com, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I'm actually on there where I got my beats. I got albums on there now. Called yeah, and uh, the, the first three two out. I got two albums and a couple of singles on there, mm -hmm. and it's the Black Sheep. That's the name of the my my the artist page. Okay, artist page. Okay. And then the, yeah, one of them's called Black Sheep Vibes Volume One. The other one's called Black Sheep Vibes Volume Two. Each one of them got like twelve records on them, mm -hmm. skate beats and stuff. And then I got a bunch of singles that I you know put on there. Wow. Yeah, and, and and it's starting to get a buzz because now DJs from around the country starting to get a little hip. Okay. And they downloading it, so it's taking the music further out. You know what I'm saying? Another level. So, so out of all these years, you're still surrounded by me. You can't get away I from I can't get it to the day I die, bro. From, you know what I'm saying? To the day I die, so, it's, it's so, there. So God just took and reset you, you know, yep. give you the proper foundation yep you know what i mean and then put you right back in and put me right to back the, in. Uh, to, the, to the right back into the swing thing yeah so and, and there's a uh uh i was told long not a, yeah a while ago that you know that god is not gonna give you more than you can handle mm -hmm. so i believe that i've been spoon fed up to this point with you know all that you know, as long as I don't lose focus and I know that it's not about me. Right. So I know that it's not about me and I try to stay, keep my ears, eyes, heart open to hear what's, you know, mm -hmm. what I'm being told. And uh, to just move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, so Let's not forget about the mentoring. I know you do uh, mentoring. You do any mentoring for our DJing with the, with, the, with the youth? Yeah, the younger DJs, mm -hmm. shout out, they as you, you, they all call me Uncle Bam. Oh, all of them. Hey, hey man. Swizzy, <laughs> Prodigy, yeah. Flash, they all call me that's, Uncle that's Bam. That's respect though. Yeah, that's, that's and, respect. and I call them all nephew. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's how I look at them because I've been DJing and in this music thing. Let me, tell, let me think about this real quick. Close to 30 years. 30 plus. Yeah, I count, count, I count 32, 33. <laughs> 21, because I really got into a heavy. I'm going to go day. back to you as a music is in high school. Junior. Well, yeah, yeah, but I was just talking about from a DJ oh, standpoint. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I started DJing when 
was like 17, 16, okay. 17. So yeah, I'm 53. Yeah. So 30 plus. 30 plus. So yeah, I just pull up aside, alongside them and you know, they got open ears. I don't, you know, judge nobody. I just be like, hey nephew, just, just some advice. Right. You know, maybe you should think about taking this move or you know, I'll see them, maybe he'll post something on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Nah, hit him up. Hey man, maybe you should delete that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I know that somebody did you dirty, yeah. but you, you you know you don't want that kind of you just you know that energy. That energy, yeah. right, and that kind of stuff. So I just be like, you know, so it's it's I I enjoy it makes me feel good when you know they see me or I see them and they be like, hey Uncle Bam, I be like, hey nephew, that's that's a good feeling. Right. You know, it reminds me of when I was a football coach. I got you. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's what it's about for me. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to give back, be the best band I can be. Yeah. I'm trying to be the best band I can be behind the turntables, not behind the turntables. Just when you see me on the street, they can just be like, that dude love God, he a good dude. I can't think of nothing negative or bad to say about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, all right, Dan, well, I, I thank you for coming and stopping by. Absolutely, we, bro, we anytime. TV, we TV and all. We TV, y'all. <laughs> any, any plugs you want to plug as far as your social media handles, you can do that right now. Every, uh, I am DJ Bam DC. I am DJ B-A-M DC on everything. All platforms. All platforms. All right, you so, guys heard it here. Here on WeTV, DJ Bam, we out.